of mankind, the king of mankind, the god of mankind. From the evil of the whisperer, who whispers evil in the hearts of men. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is your brother Yahya Ibrahim once again. Alhamdulillah, we're looking at life lessons from the Quran, a study of Surah Taha and the life of Musa alayhi salam. And we're, you know, on verse number two now, we're beginning to get into this beautiful chapter. We've come to know that the Surah, it's a Meccan Surah, and the Prophet is the one who is primarily being addressed. But the address for the rest of the Surah is all humanity. Ya Rajul, O mankind, O people, pay attention to this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, speaking to the Prophet directly, مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتَشْقَى It was not to distress you, O Prophet of Allah, that we sent down the Qur'an upon you or to you. Now I want to pause here for a second. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negating something? Why is Allah saying that this isn't the reason for the Qur'an? Well, the reason, the sabab of the nuzul of these verses were three people visited the Prophet sallallahu and they were the most of notable people in Quraysh. Abu al-Hakam ibn Hisham, who the Prophet would refer to as Abu Jahl. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, who is the father of Khalid ibn al-Walid, who Allah would send verses in the Quran condemning him to Jahannam. And Abu Sufyan, who later would become a believer. He's the only one who comes to believe. Radi Allahu anhu wa arda, after his coming into Islam. The three people, they came to the Prophet sallam both in ridicule and in regret. They said to him, قَدْ أَشْقَيْتَ نَفْسَكَ يَا Muhammad. Ya Muhammad, you burdened yourself. Why did you do this? Had we known you had this talent, see, they assume that the Qur'an is just from him. Had we known that you had this Qur'an and you had this thing, if you had come to us, we could have made you rich. We could have used this. We could have used this talent to rule over all the Arabs. We could have, you know, spoken these words and, you know, we could have attracted more people. But you've done this the wrong way. You've made yourself against us. You're standing all night to pray. Why? No one sees you. Why are you doing all that? Do you really believe that this is of any value? And Allah is the one who defends the Prophet Allah says this Qur'an can never bring about distress. The essence of the Qur'an, and this is al-mafhum bil-mukhalif. In the language of the Arab, you understand something more clearly by knowing what opposes it. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I didn't send the Qur'an to distress you, what Allah is actually saying and implying quite clearly is that I sent this Qur'an to relieve you. It's not to distress you, meaning Ya Muhammad, it is only for your relief. It is only for your good. It is only for what will bring you happiness. We need to take a life lesson. And this is, you know, an important life lesson. To the person who sees you from a distance, they might think, that what you're doing to please Allah is too much. You know, if someone was to see you on a hot day, fasting in Ramadan, and you're hot, and you're tired, and you would love a drink of cold water, but the only reason you don't is because you're fasting. And there they are, they're sitting next to you at work, and they're eating and drinking, and they look at you and they say, قَدْ أَشْقَيْتَ نَفْسَكَ why are you burdening yourself? Does this really please God? Does it make God happy with you that you can't eat and drink what you normally do? What they don't see and what people forget is for a human being to feel value, they need to strive for something. So when Allah says it's not to distress you, meaning that whatever you endure for me, O Muhammad, Whatever you endure for me, O Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then know it isn't for distress because I wanted to make things difficult for you. It's actually better for you. And I want you to think of this statement, a life lesson for you. Whenever Allah says no, or Allah says don't, 
or Allah says Hurrima, it's haram for you, or Allah says La taqrabu, don't come near it, or Allah says, you know, there's punishment for this. It's not because Allah wants to make your life difficult, it's because that is what is best. Stay away from the haram because that is what is best. Do what is good because that is actually what is best. Don't be enticed with the haram, even though it might look easier. You can probably make more money by doing haram things. You can make more money more quickly by doing haram. But it's not the right thing. And it's not what's best for you. And Allah says that He has not sent this Qur'an, the laws of Al-Islam, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, to make life difficult. Rather, it brings relief in this life and the next, if practiced wholeheartedly and truly. So the next life lesson that we learn is the justification of the difficulties we endure in life is that we have a goal in life. You know, a medical student, they're up for 20, 30 hour shifts in medical school. And you and I, we might look at it, that's crazy, why do they do that? But I want to be a doctor and I must struggle. For everything in your life that is worth attaining, worth gaining, worth doing, for every great success that you seek, you have to give something up. You're not going to be a doctor by just sitting and watching TV. You're not going to become a leader by just, you know, following others. You have to give something up. You have to do something that other people are unwilling to do in the same capacity to succeed in life and in the next life. That's the message. I didn't send this Quran to distress you. It might inadvertently for people who don't know, who don't see the final goal, who don't know about Jannah, they find it strange that you wake up at four in the morning to pray. It's strange. Why would you do that? It's shaqa. Why would you disturb your sleep in the best part of sleep? Because, illa tadhkiratan liman yakhsha. Because the Quran and Islam is only a reminder for the one who has khashya, who has awe and love and hope and fear of Allah. It's for the one who's sincere with Allah. And that third verse is a very important verse for us. Illa tadhkira. It's only a reminder. This is the first place. Remember I told you in a previous episode that there are 10 places in the Quran where Allah talks about remembering and that mankind is forgetful. Why are we named insan? Insan comes from nisyan, forgetful. We forget Allah. Nasullaha. They forget Allah. Insan, you and I as human beings, we forget the majesty of Allah. We forget what Allah demands of us. We forget what is necessary to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship of Him because of who He is and what he is deserving of, and that our worship doesn't honor him or magnify him more than he already is subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by not worshiping him, it doesn't tarnish Allah or make Allah less than who he is. Illa tadhkira. It's a reminder. For who? Me and you. But is it for all human beings? No. Who benefits from the Qur'an? Is it everyone? Is everyone who picks up the Qur'an? There's a lot of people who know the Qur'an inside out in different languages, but it's of no benefit to them. Because it is liman yakhsha, for the one who has khashya, taqwa, piety, submissiveness to God. That beauty of unraveling the meaning of the Qur'an is not open for everyone who just simply reads it. It's intentionally kept for those who honor God. Look at the verses of the Qur'an in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, Alif la meem. ذلك الكتاب. This book, لا ريب فيه. In it there is no doubt. In it or about it. Hudan. It's a guidance. But for who? للمتقين. For those who possess taqwa. Not lil alameen for all humanity, for all that exists. No. The Quran is not going to be understood by everyone. Lil muttaqeen. 
The one who will benefit for it is the one who has piety, humility, love of Allah and the maker of the heavens and the earth. And therefore, tadhkirah. The Qur'an serves as a reminder. Everything in the Qur'an, we know it in our heart. We know not to do wrong. We know al-halal ubayyin wal haram ubayyin, as is in the hadith in Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ tells us, halal is clear, haram is clear. Well, everyone knows right from wrong. Don't lie, don't steal, don't commit sexual immorality. Everyone knows what it is. But the Qur'an is a reminder, an eloquent reminder. And the one who will hear the reminder and understand the reminder, تَذْكِرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى The one who has within them khashya. That word is powerful. The word khashya, it's not just simply the one who's afraid of Allah. And khashya, it's not an emotional fear. Khawf is emotional. And there's places in the Qur'an where Allah will say to Musa, قُلْنَا لَا تَخَفْ Don't have fear. Fear is emotional. You know, you're afraid. It's inside all human beings. We have the capacity to be afraid. And it can paralyze us. Khawf is different to khashya. Khawf is not an illogical fear. It's a calculated understanding of why I should fear something. That's the difference. I hope you join me after the break as we continue with our discussion of Surah Taha. Join me again, inshallah, shortly after this short break. In the name of Allah. He faces. He listens. My question is about the beard, about Imam Mahdi. What are the people believing? He answers. So number one is the help of Allah. He satisfies in the light of glorious Quran and authentic Hadith. If Allah helps you, believe me, you have to get success. Catch Dr. Zakir. Then you have the next call, please. To get convincing and valid answers in Dial Dr. Zakir every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 9.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. Where truth is hidden, misleading quotations create confusion. Where truth is hidden, lack of knowledge and wisdom cause upheaval and commotion. Where truth is hidden, manipulated scriptures and twisted facts emerge. This very hidden truth creates false propaganda, mayhem, chaos, disorder, and turmoil in our lives and the world order. But is there anyone with courage and wisdom? What is the truth and who has the courage to expose it? Because it's the right to know the truth. Right. Watch Truth Prevail and Lies Perish in Truth Exposed by Dr. Zakir Naik next on Peace TV. In the name of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is your brother Yahya Ibrahim once again. Thank you for joining me back. Alhamdulillah, you know, we've been proceeding it with Surah Taha. We've come to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this Quran tailored for particular individuals. It's not for everyone. And in Surah Qaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's not for everyone to benefit from, that it will affect them. Surah Qaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this Quran is a dhikr. And that this dhikr will benefit, will be understood by liman kana lahu qalb, by the one who has a heart that is awake. Aw al-qassamma, the one who gives it its full attention. Wa huwa shaheed. And third, the one who witnesses its truthfulness and doesn't deny it before studying it. Those three things, whenever they come together in any one person, they believe in Allah. 
those three things, their heart is soft. They don't have an audacity towards Allah. They're not rebellious against the concept of a creator and an ultimate power behind all things. Two, they give it its attention. They want to study it. They want to know what does it say? And three, is that they don't deny it before giving it a chance to impact their life. Tazkiratan liman yakhsha. Tanzilan. The next verse. This Quran is tanzilan. Mimman khalaq al arda wa samawat al ula. It's a revelation from high above, from the one who created the earth and the high heavens. It's a beautiful verse. This verse is the only one like it in the Quran. In all other places in the Quran, Allah always talks about the heavens before the earth. As samawati wal ard. But here, Allah talks about al ard was samawat and then the heavens, al ula, the high heavens. And it's a peculiar, peculiar reason, and we're going to focus on it as a life lesson. First, the Quran is tanzilan. The Quran was brought down. And the word tanzil, it's not just nazal. It didn't just come all at one time. It's tanzil, meaning it came down in bits and pieces, in stages and steps. It came down munajjaman, according to particular reasons and particular times. It wasn't just one sentence that was sent to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu jumlatan wahida. Rather, it came down in parts at times and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would raise some of it and keep some of it and send others in its place of what he had raised. مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا So, tanzilan, it's come down. So for it to come down, someone's got to bring it down. And all of this really clarifies what the word Qur'an means. Whenever we hear the word Qur'an, what comes to mind and what the technical definition of the Qur'an means is that it is Kalamullah. It is the true word of God. Al-Munazzal that is brought down ala qalbi Muhammad on the heart of only Muhammad, only to Muhammad Sallallahu Jibril through Jibril, no one else. Al-Muta'abbadu bitilawati. You earn reward by uttering it and reading it. It's the only document on earth that when you pick it up and read it, it earns you a, a hasana, a righteous deed for every letter. Alif, lam, meem, alif, harf. Lam, harf, meem, harf. Alif, lam, meem, 30 hasanat. Each hasana is 10 times its amount. That isn't the same for Bukhari or Muslim or the hadith books, right? It's significant. Al-muta'abbadu bitilawati. Al-mahfoodu fi suduri wal masahif. It is gathered in the chest of people and in the mushaf. Anyone who says that there's a letter that's changed from the Qur'an or even a vowel that's changed from the Qur'an disbelieves in Allah. Because the Qur'an is guarded in the hearts of people and guarded in the bindings of the mushaf. Walillahi alhamd. Tanzil. So one of the definitions of the Qur'an is that it is a revelation. It's come down from above through Jibreel. Tanzilan min man, from the one. It's not tanzilan min Allah. It is from the one. Min man, only Allah. Khalaq al-arda wa samawat al-ula. The one who created the earth and the high heavens. The imams, they disputed as to why, you know, the earth was put in this verse before the heavens. And the answer that seems to be, alhamdulillah, a most prevalent and makes the most sense to me, wallahu a'lam, is that the earth, you know, the Arab at the time of the Prophet, these Bedouins, if you were to tell them, look up at the stars and the moon, the Prophet says to us in another hadith, the reason we look for the moon and don't make the calculations is because we are an ummah that is ummi. The, the Arabs, they were a people who were illiterate. They couldn't look up into the heavens and earth and, and understand what's there. And Allah tells us in the Quran, مواقع النجوم, look at 
the place of where these stars are. وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ And I vow by the stars because if you knew where the stars were and what they are, you would understand their magnificence. And Allah tells us in the Quran, لَخَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ خَلْقِ النَّاسِ The creation of the heavens and the earth is a more miraculous, more amazing creation than the creation of you human beings. We sometimes look at ourselves as being the greatest thing that's in this world. But that's not the reality. So it's as if Allah is saying to them, look, look, don't look far away. Look to what you have now. Look to the earth you stand on. Look to the gold you trade with. Look to the fruit that comes from the earth. The one who made everything that you can feel and touch and stand upon and eat and drink. The one who made this real thing in front of you is also the one who made what you don't understand. What is high above you. And that teaches us an important life lesson, which is to talk to people according to their ability and reason. You know, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba Ali radiallahu anhu, there's these famous statements was said, Hadithu nasa ala qadri uqulihim. Speak to people according to what they can understand. What good is it speaking to the Bedouins and then there's people in Quraysh? and talking about the stars and the moon and the planets so far away, when all they know is this dust and this earth. And that's why Allah would give such powerful examples. You know, in the Qur'an, Allah gives the example of life and death like rain that rains down on the earth. خَاشِعَ The earth was still. بَإِذَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْهَا الْمَاءَ اهْتَزَّتْ وَرَبَتْ When water touches that earth, it almost shakes and comes to life. So Allah tells them, look to what you have. But now there's another step for you and I, which is you and I, we need to consider what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us to ponder over. He wants us as a life lesson for you and I in our life to take mention and hold of what is real before what is imaginary and distant, what is near before what is far, right? It's an important way of looking at your life and it's an important way of talking to people about faith and about Allah. Talk about the things that matter to people, the things that is real to them, that they can understand and grasp its context. Ar-Rahman. The one who created the earth and the heavens above it, he is Ar-Rahman. He is defined by Himself as the ever-merciful, meaning the Lord of mercy. عَلَى الْعَرْشِ istawa Upon the magnificent arsh, He is istawa. He remains subhanahu wa ta'ala in the manner that befits His majesty. إِسْتِوَاءً يَلِيقُ بِجَلَالِهِ He is above the throne in the way that he describes and in the meaning that he seeks for us to understand. Bila takif, without us saying how. Wala ta'til, without denying it. Wala tamthil, or saying it could be like it. Wala ta'wil, or perhaps, or tashbih, or making a similitude. Allah is doing what is similar to this. All of that is forfeit. All of that is nonsense. All of that has no place. And these verses are important for us to understand as a part of our aqidah. That Allah refers to His name, Ar-Rahman, and He establishes also a, uh, an attribute for Himself, which is that He is above the arsh, above His creation. All of the creation is beneath Allah. And Allah is Al-Ali. He is the most elevated, most high, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that none encroach upon Him, none ascend to Him further than the limit that he has set subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, they misunderstand, you know, verses that relate to the names and attributes of Allah. And I can give you a very simple example to clarify it. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lahu uh, yad, he has a hand. And when we say that the ulama taught us to hide our hands so that no one looks and say, you know, misunderstand. Yadullah fawqa aydihim. Yet in the same verse in the Quran, Allah talks about His hand and the hands of the companions of human beings. 
Yadullahi fawqa aydihim. The hand of Allah is above the hands of the Sahaba. Of course, no sane person, no believer in Allah would make an equation or equate between the hand of the Sahaba and the hand of Allah Azza wa Jal. I hope you join me again shortly as we continue with our study of Surah Taha and lessons from the life of Musa alayhi salam. Please join me again soon. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful.